just their whole free will philosophy system doesn't fit into the scriptures and never did and it never will. And I, I just have a challenge for the grace community, you know, Greg and David Jackson, all these people that say that the knowledge of the, the tree of the knowledge of the good and evil that we see, if it's possible that there could have been two free will agents that made the right choice and never sinned, because they believe that scenario could have taken place, obviously, because the tree was given to prove free will. There was no illusion of choice. They believe it was actual choice. In other words, they there could have been two agents that never sinned, never committed the action of eating of the tree. Then why didn't God create those two people to represent us all? That's a good question to ask those people, since they believe that God didn't want the fall and didn't want sin to happen. Why didn't God create two free will agents that he knew from his omniscient perspective would have made the right choice since that is possible. They keep insisting that's possible. Well, then why didn't God do that? Why hasn't it happened? Why was it the very opposite? Why was it two agents that fell and they represented us all? Do you believe that you could have made a better choice than them been placed in their spot? I'd like to read a comment here that there's been a lot of debate over lately, and a lot of people are coming out from the free grace community defending this um defending this um position that God gave us free will. And you know, this is something that a lot of people I think just generically think. I think almost every single Christian comes from this point where they just hear the term free will. You hear it, you hear it enough, and you believe it. And from your standpoint, from your limited perspective as a human being on earth, it seems that you move about freely, sure. However, no one's really thinking past what they see in the physical realm. There is a spiritual realm. Do we not all believe that? There is the seen and the unseen. And so if you think about causality, which is the ultimate origin of why things happen, one may say that that's the heart. And the heart, as we know from Jeremiah 17, 9, is desperately wicked. So that's our starting point, desperately wicked heart. That's an admonishment on all men, or I shouldn't say an admonishment. That's a declaration on all men. So. Motives in your heart, you know, they can be desperately wicked. A lot of us still have sinful thoughts and things that we don't do, but yet we think them. And Christ already declared that itself, that thought itself is a sin. So in the thought that we have a free will, do we really know what's what why we do the things we do? Is it truly us that wants to do them? Or is there an antecedent cause of everything? And is it all part of God's plan? That's the question here. And so if we read this comment, you know, I want you guys to at least contemplate causality, meaning what is really, what's the moving factor beyond everything that we see in the universe? And do we really have free will? Because you may have thought that your whole life, I never really thought, do I, do I make that decision? It seems like I'm making it. I even decide I might do this or I might do that or I might, might not, might. And then you finally come to a decision to do something. But what's the causality of that? And so it says here in this common in order to believe uh, man doesn't have free will. One must also believe that God is the author of sin. I'd like to start out by saying that that's not in the scripture, whether God is the author of sin or not. This This is... This is an importation by someone They're putting something in there to kind of charge God with something if they could. So it says, in order to believe man doesn't have free will, one must also believe that God is the author of sin and caused Eve to disobey God by eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
And any God, lowercase g, who causes man to sin isn't the God of the Bible. And one must believe in the God of the Bible and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be saved. So here we have a very strong statement that you should consider the implications of. That you may not have believed in the God of the Bible, and you might not be saved. Because if you believe that God declares everything to be, like he says in uh, Isaiah 46.10, I declare the end from the beginning. When God says he declares something, I mean, do you guys believe that God works in the world, that he holds the universe up, that the atoms and the molecules and everything working in, con in conjunction with one another? Is that the work of God or is that the work of you? Just, just consider that if we're going to keep things simple and not even going into scripture. We will go into scripture, but to think of it in simplistic terms, is God working in the world? Is he working in the universe? Is he working in your reality? Did he create you? Did he create your DNA? Did he write your DNA? Or did you write your own DNA? Okay, this free will concept is so pagan, that it's, it's, it's beyond the pale to think that you have it. And also, not only that, that now you must believe in it to have salvation from the God of the Bible. Bible, quote unquote. So the God of the Bible has to be this God that gives free will to you, which also is nowhere in scripture. Uh, and Chris, I'd like you to, you know, articulate that point uh, about Eve in the garden, the tempter and the tree, and why that might be there, why those things were set in that way by God. Yeah. Well, as like you said, he declares the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things that have not been done, saying my purposes will be established and I'll accomplish all my good pleasure. So it says he declares the end from the beginning, that before things even begin, he declares how they'll end. It says from ancient times. So we go all the way back to Genesis. We go all the way back to the garden. And people with a free will perspective, they believe in the scenario where God gave them the choice. And they believe there was a scenario by which they could have not fallen, that they would have made the right choice and never sinned. They believe in that scenario, which then world would have gone on. There would have never been a fall. There would have never been anyone that sinned. Now, you have to ask yourself if that's true, that scenario, and they believe God gave this free will choice, then why did God create two individuals that ended up sinning if he could have made two individuals that would have made the right choice? If God in his omniscient knowledge didn't want the world to go into a fall and could have made any two individuals to represent all of humanity and this free will choice thing is possible, why didn't he create two individuals that made the right choice and never sinned to represent us all? So that goes to show you that God wanted the fall. See, in the free will humanist perspective, man just believes that reality was created and it centers around them. But the Bible says that all things were made through him and for him and without him, nothing was made that was made. That all things were made for Jesus Christ himself. That's what they were made for. And they center around him and his cross, which the Bible says the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. God already had a plan. And so when we look at the Garden of Eden and when these people in these free will perspectives suggest that, you know, God made these two representatives, and they could have made the right choice, but they didn't. They ended up falling. Well, why did he create those two people? If if there is a situation and a scenario where God can create two individuals, instead of making Adam and Eve, why didn't he make Bill and Jessica? The two individuals that would have made the right choice, would not have eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, would not have sinned, and we would all be in paradise today. If that's what God had willed. If that's what God had wanted. See, their free will scenario does not make sense. God gets what he wants. He declares the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things that have not been done, saying my purposes will be established. And I will accomplish all my good pleasure. So from the very beginning, he declares how things will end. It wasn't an accident to fall. It wasn't a free will choice by which, you know, they had this choice and they could have done otherwise. If that's what God wanted, he would have created two individuals that would have made the right choice to represent us all. See, we're all being represented by people by which we weren't there to make the choice. Do you think you would have made a better choice? See, that's what free will people believe. Ultimately, hey, if I was in the garden, 
I would have made a better choice. I would have never eaten from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, having given the chance. No, there was two representatives. These were the best representatives. They fell, and that's the case. There was no other scenario that could have taken place. Well, that's such a terrific point because on Judgment Day, these people in their frame of mind now, if it were to be Judgment Day, they can look across over at the White Throne. They could say, hey, you guys, you didn't do what I did. You didn't make the right choice. You know, even though Jesus himself said that no man can come to me unless the Father who sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. John 12, 32 says, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. Who is the all? Let's take a look at a verse that represents all. How about Luke 3, 6? I don't know if this is a scripture that many give consideration, but there's no specific context to this. I mean, I'll give you some context. Luke 5, Luke 3, 5, every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be brought low. And the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways shall be made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Now, what did Jesus say? I think it was to Nicodemus. Uh, he said, no man can see the kingdom of God. A man must be born again, or he shall not see the kingdom of God. See, So seeing, perceiving, and having salvation. Those who see the kingdom of God see salvation. So if one derives from this verse, Luke 3, 6, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God, well, one would have to think that the all in that verse means every single man since Adam, right? Well, we all collectively agree that that ain't happening, okay? Even the 8 billion people left on the earth right now, out of that 8 billion, if this is the last generation and the rapture is going to happen in the next 60 to 80 years, let's say, well, God already knows how many of them will believe? It's not like he's on the sidelines, sidelines rather, wringing his hands and saying, come on, you, you guys could believe, rooting these people in. He already knows who the sheep and the goats are out of those 8 billion. So if this were to be the last generation of people that live on the earth, God already knows that most of them are goats. Most of them won't see the salvation of God. So we can all collectively agree that. So we can't say that every single person living today has a shot to be saved because God already knows that they don't. So if we think with the mind of God, knowing that God knows they won't be saved, why wouldn't we understand that, that not all of them can be saved? Now, we don't know who the elect are by looking at them, so we simply preach Christ crucified. Those who will believe are the ones who are drawn. Jesus said, no man can come to me unless my father draws them, right? Well, he also said, uh, all that the Father giveth to me shall come to me. So, guys, coming is believing. If Jesus is saying no man can come to me unless the Father who sent me draw him, he's really saying no man can believe on me unless the Father who sent me draw him. So this isn't like an open invite for just any old person that they can just get saved by the gospel. Jesus makes it very, very clear that they have to be drawn by the Father. And, and all who are drawn will be saved. He's not going to shoot and miss 99% of the time or however what the ratio would be. Yeah, all flesh just in biblical context means men from every tribe, tongue, and nation of people, not just the Jewish biology, but now the Russian biology, now the Chinese biology, all flesh. That's what it means. It doesn't mean every single individual like they keep proposing. But I would like a to like people like Dave and Greg to answer this question, people in the, the other community with the free will position they keep arguing from. If it is the case that it was God's will, and they believe it was God's will that they didn't sin in the garden, then and they believe that there could have been a scenario of a of a two free will agents that made the right choice that never sinned, then why did God create two individuals? that did sin, that made the wrong choice when he could have made the two individuals that made the right choice and lived forever in paradise along with the rest of humanity as, as we flourish. If that's, if that's what God wanted, then why didn't he create two individuals to represent us all that never sinned since he could have done that and since that was his will, right? According to them, that was his will. So why didn't he do it? We have to ask yourself, why didn't God do it? If, if, he, 
If he could have created two individuals to represent us all, that wouldn't have made the right choice according to them. And that's why God created the garden for showing love and showing this free will choice scenario. Then why didn't he create a situation where we of two individuals that lived with God forever made the right choice? Because see, what they're in the garden, when you disobeyed, it showed that you didn't love God. It showed that when you sinned, you didn't love God because you weren't obedient to the command. Well, why didn't God create two individuals if that's what he wanted, this free will loving choice where someone, and that's what he wanted, why didn't he make two free will agents that didn't sin, didn't fall, represented us all by which they love God and we flourish forever? It's because that's, I'll tell you why, because that's not what God wanted. He's in the heavens and he does whatever he pleases. They have a God that's not suiting with the scriptures. They keep trying to import free will everywhere, even in the Garden of Eden, which you just cannot see that demonstrated. If you think about it, it just doesn't make any logical sense. They keep insisting that this was a option of free will. There's obviously two agents that could have never sinned. God gave the option, they believe. Why did he create two individuals that sinned? See, they're, they're so I mean, invested in their free will choice. They just think so highly of themselves and their choice. Like, again, if they believe if I was there in the garden, I wouldn't have sinned. You know, give, give, put someone else there. They would have made the right choice. Put someone else there. They would have, we would have flourished forever in paradise. Well, God could have done that, but he didn't do that. You got to ask yourself why he didn't. Well, I'll tell you, because he didn't want it. <laughs> right. He would have never been able to introduce the lamb slain before the foundation of the world if Eve didn't sin. So what were you rooting for that Eve didn't sin? This is, this is libertarian free will at its worst is when you think that there was some other outcome that could have happened besides exactly what God determined before the foundation of the world. If you believe that you have a free will, that you're just so free, you're free to do whatever you want. And this is why I made that correlation with Aleister Crowley and the do as thou wilt saying that he had the mantra of Aleister Crowley. It wasn't to say that people like David Benjamin and, and, and Greg Jackson are, are, you know, satanic people. I mean, they're kind of saying that about us because if you talk about God's predestination and his determination, you know, that's a satanic doctrine. I'm not saying they're satanic. I'm just saying they're completely in denial of the sovereignty of God and that that type of thinking more lends to the do as thou wilt type of mantra. Because if you don't believe that you uh, God is totally sovereign, Okay, so let me give you an example. This, this is what Greg will like to say a lot, and it's, it just rings in my ears from listening to his videos. For In the past, I remember hearing it over and over again and never really agreeing with it, but kind of just like pushing it off to the side for now because I myself didn't fully have all this worked out yet. But he would say things like, God is 100% sovereign, but man has free will. Both are true. Uh, that's not in the scripture anywhere. There's nothing to support that. That is a total importation of him He's just really making that up. And then he has this quote where if you don't believe in, you know, Eve in the garden and God causing her sin and the God, author of sin and the God of the Bible and all these prerequisites for now believing in the right God, this is just muddying the waters. Now, now who's believing in the right God? And so if you really want this free will so bad, how bad do you want it? That's my question to the people that believe they're so hung up about how could you say we don't have free will? Well, do you want to be free from God? Did God create you? All I ask is that you consider these things. Is God working in you? He said he began a good work in you. I mean, the scriptures are so plain to see. To outright deny them is to deny the sovereignty of God. To say that God is 100% sovereign, but man has free will is an oxymoronical statement. That's even a word, but it, it, it just it's it, it's two things that are it's oil and water. They're contradictory, uh, contradictory. God cannot be 100 percent sovereign over all, meaning having control of all things. It's almost as if these people want to say, well, I have control. It's almost like they're saying pro-choice. Right. How many times do you have to hear these stupid arguments about pro-choice? Uh, you know, man, no man can tell me that. You know, I, what I have to do with my body, my body, my choice. Well, I have free will. Well, all I hear is that you want to be free from God. Because if God doesn't determine all, even the bad, and makes it work all to his good pleasure, and then what God are you really believing in? He's not actively working in all things. He's kind of just like, you know, outside of time, just looking in at his creation, do its thing, and, 
you know, maybe he'll step in every now and then and make a king do this and make a king do that. He'll declare a prophet here, an apostle there, but the other inhabitants of the earth, they can do according to their will. Well, Daniel 4.35 says the polar opposite of that. We lean on the scripture, not the arm of flesh. And that's not a boast. Just saying that's what we do. We lean on the scripture. And the scripture says that God does according to his will among the inhabitants of the earth. Yeah. Yeah, and exactly. And that would include those who believe in the Son. Those that believe in the Son are doing the will of God, and God is causing them to do the will of God, which is direct opposition to the will of the devil. Because we know that the gospel is to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, which is the will of God. This is the will of my Father, that all that look to the Son and believe in him will have eternal life, which is in direct opposition to Satan, which is not to believe. We see that it says that, Correct opponents with gentleness, if God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been led captive by him to do his will. The will of the devil is in direct opposition to the will of the Father, which is to have people believe in the Son. And the scripture says that the unbelievers that haven't been granted repentance, they're in a snare, they're caught in a trap. So it says they're held captive to do the devil's will, that they're caught in a trap. It says that Unless they're granted repentance, they don't come to the knowledge of the truth. They don't come to their senses. So they have to be granted by God repentance. So to, in order to do the will of God, in other words, to do the will of God, to believe in the Son, God has to grant repentance so that people come to the knowledge of the truth, that they come to their senses, that it happens to do with the mind, that there is a change of mind. And then they escape the snare of the devil, having been led captive to by him to do as well. I don't know how these people come up with this free will system when the Bible says that unbelievers are held captive by the devil to do his will, which is to not believe in the Son. And they act like, oh, anyone can believe. You can believe in the Son. Like they're just believing in the Eiffel Tower in Paris. When the Bible says that these people are held captive by the devil to do his will, that they their minds are not in a place where they have come to their senses and to the knowledge of the truth. And in order that to happen, God has to grant repentance. And see, we can instruct people. It says instruct opponents with gentleness. If God may have perhaps grant them repentance. See, it doesn't say correct opponents with gentleness in the hopes that they just repent as though it was dependent upon themselves and this free will system. It's dependent upon God in the hopes that God will grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth, that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been led captive by him to do as well. Right. And it's key that you're mentioning how, you know, so that they may come to the knowledge of the truth. What do we all collectively agree that the knowledge of the truth is? It's the gospel. Okay. It's the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So to come to the knowledge of the truth needs to be granted unto one. And I mean, how many scriptures do we have to show before people start to succumb to the scripture and just relent to it and just put aside their fleshly carnal nature to think that, Oh, God just loves us all with a salvific love, and we could all be saved, and that's just a blanket thing for every single man born since Adam. This is so untrue. You're denying yourself the truth and revelation that God has given to you through his word, okay? It says in here, Philippians 1.29, for unto you it is given in behalf of Christ, in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Okay, so what is it saying there? It's saying that it's been given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe. It's something that's been given to you, just like just like in Matthew eleven twenty seven, where it talks about how nobody knows the Father but the Son, and nobody knows the Son but the Father and who he chooses to reveal him to. I mean, that's a huge thing to, to understand. It's it's weighty. And I think people should give it consideration, at least. Matthew eleven twenty seven, 27, a multitude of other verses like that. A multitude. John 6 is where all of this comes from. We're not out here just saying this to piss people off. I mean, John 6, 45 says, It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Every man therefore that hath heard, and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Okay, Jesus doesn't miss. Okay, the Father doesn't miss. He doesn't draw people, and then they just... It, up, going to resist that, and you know, we're we're, we're not going to believe. You know, we don't believe that. Okay, that's not a thing. It says, "Every man, therefore, that hath heard, 
So that's a limited amount of people. That's not every single person. It says every man, therefore, that has heard. So they have to have heard it. And then it says, and hath learned. So they heard, they learned, and then they cometh unto him. This is this is exclusionary. You know, I mean, I know that could be weighty, it could bother people. John 6 is not an open invitation. John 6 clearly points out that there's a will of the Father, and that's all who come to him, him will be saved. It's not going to be a matter of, you know, uh, 1% of them get saved, or however you want to look at the ratio of saved to unsaved. No, he loses none. And I think a lot of the Chris may come to the fact that they think it's because, well, God needs a reason. He needs an accountability to punish people. That's why we have free will. That's the real you know, ground or foundation that they're coming from, I think. But Jude one ten says something interesting that may speak to that. These people disparage all things that they do not understand and all the things that they know by instinct, like unreasoning animals. By these things, they are destroyed. So it's almost like the ignorance of an animal that people destroy in a village for killing someone. Like if a tiger in Indonesia kills a, a person in the village or whatever, they try to find that tiger and kill it. All he's doing is doing his own instinct. And Jude one ten seems to, and, and, and the famous, most famous verse that we could think of, uh, it's here in Luke 22, 34. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. So he's, why is Jesus praying for people that know not what they do? you have anything on that? Yeah, exactly. They keep saying that, you know, you have to really be in a full understanding to know what you're rejecting to be able to be held accountable. Well, if that's the case, that you have to have complete understanding to be held accountable in terms of the gospel or anything, then why is Jesus saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do? If being ignorant makes you innocent, in other words, not having understanding of what you're doing makes you innocent, then why would Jesus be appealing to forgiveness for the Father? And like that Jude verse that you gave you, gave a great example of the tiger in a village in Indonesia. That was a great example. Um, that, you know, an unreasoning example. animal, an unreasoning animal just acting according to its own instinct and it's destroyed, doesn't fully know what it's doing. It says they speak evil of things they do not understand, but yet they says they are destroyed. And that's the same way you see an animal. It might attack a person, doesn't act, understand the, the full implications of attacking a human being made in the image of God. And they destroy that animal anyways. See, they have this whole false free will system that you have to have full, complete understanding to have account accountability in order to be dis uh, destroyed. But it says these like brute beasts, like unreasoning animals, speak evil of things they do not understand. Well, will likewise perish. They'll perish in their own corruption, even though they don't understand quite fully what they're doing. They're still held accountable. So. It's just their whole free will philosophy system doesn't fit into the scriptures. It never did and it never will. And I, I just have a challenge for the grace community. You know, Greg and David Jackson, all these people that say that the knowledge of the, the tree of the knowledge of the good of evil that we see. If it's possible that there could have been two free will agents that made the right choice and never sinned, because they believe that scenario could have taken place, obviously, because the tree was given to prove free will. There was no illusion of choice. They believe it was actual choice. In other words, they there could have been two agents that never sinned, never committed the action of eating of the tree. Then why didn't God create those two people to represent us all? That's a good question to ask those people, since they believe that God didn't want the fall and didn't want sin to happen. Why didn't God create two free will agents that he knew from his omniscient perspective would have made the right choice since that is possible. They keep insisting that's possible. Well, then why didn't God do that? Why hasn't it happened? Why was it the very opposite? Why was it two agents that fell and they represented us all? Do you believe that you could have made a better choice than them been placed in their spot? Do, do you believe that someone else that in existence could have made a better choice than they did be given they'd be put in their spot? And if you do believe that, then why didn't God create those people that would have made the right choice and put them in the spot if that's what God ultimately desired? No fall. It's something they will never be able to answer. They will never be able to answer it in the logic. Now, David will be able to go on to maybe an hour and a half community college lecture and, and kind of give you a bunch of esoteric 
things with a bunch of flowery speech, but they'll never answer it from scripture. They'll never demonstrate it in any logical, coherent way. God gets all he desires, like the verse you quoted in Daniel. Um, when I, Nebuchadnezzar, raise my eyes towards heaven, I bless the Most High who lives forever and ever. For his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, but he does according to his will among the host of heavens and among the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can hold back his hand and say, what have you done? No one can hold back his hand and say, Lord, you can't save these people and not save these people. What have you done? You've made vessels for wrath. What have you done? You can't do that. No, he does what he wants from generation to ge generation, and the will of man is accounted as nothing. So that's not the, the that's not their perspective, is it, brother? <laughs> yeah, so in conclusion to all of this, this is John 19, where it says here, John 19, in reading from verse 34, it says, but one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. He that saw it bear record, and his record is true. And he knoweth that he saith true, that ye might believe. These things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. One of him shall not be broken. This is talking about the death of Jesus Christ. The beginning of this video started with a comment about believing that God could have potentially caused Eve to sin. We have a finite, limited perspective on these things. But when we look at the totality of Scripture, we can see the story that God authored. It doesn't involve our free will. And to say that if you don't believe that God gave Eve, uh, Eve the free will to make a decision, that you don't believe in the God of the Bible, that is the biggest accusation that you can lay against someone who's a believer. We take it very seriously because we don't want there to be confusion about the gospel. And what one has to believe to be saved. I have nothing to do with this Eve in the garden stuff. It's a silly concept that somebody made up. And it's confusing people, in my opinion. If, if, you be, if you are beholden to free will, it may not confuse you. So you think you're good. But what about those people that are on the fence about predestination and free will? They might feel, you know, secondary about where they're at. They may feel a certain type of way about it. I, mean, I don't think Greg really cares or others think about those things, but. The implication is that saying God causing Eve to sin is so demonic. And what are we to say of God sending his own son to suffer and die for the sins of many? I mean, all I ask is that the people who hear this video just consider these things, that the greatest sin would be the son of God suffering a brutal death. Look up what a crucifixion is like. He had to pull his body up to take each breath in the last hours. And somebody offered him wine vinegar to drink on a sponge. Okay? Think about what Jesus suffered for you, the believer. He didn't suffer that for the unbelieving world. And Jesus himself makes that very clear. Okay, we just say what Jesus said and we get flack for it. It's incredible. We say what Jesus says and they say, are you saying? No, we said what Jesus said. But no man can come to him unless the father who sent him draws him. He will raise him up at the last day, and I believe that with my whole heart. And I know my brother Chris here does too. We're not looking to castigate anybody or talk down about them or say they're demonic. This free will concept is made up. It's not in the Bible. If it's such a big hinge that salvation weighs on it, why does God say that he will do according to his will among the inhabitants of the earth? He doesn't say he will do according to man's will. His plan of salvation is not grounded in our decision. Think of the weight of what anyone who thinks that is, is really showing. Think of how heavy that is to think that God's plan is limited to man's ability to decide whether he wants to believe the gospel or not. So he really can't do his own will, ultimately. And, you know, I would like for you to consider these things. So, no, we don't say he caused Eve to sin, but he put the tempter and the tree in the garden and they fell right into it. And then everything goes from there. God's plan is carried out. The lamb has his purpose. He's brought into the world and the entire universe is brought to uh, the knowledge of Christ, whether it be to damnation or resurrection. And we have to cope with that. We have to cope with the fact that many people are going to be damned. I'm not happy about that, but I know it to be true through his word. The entire universe 
uh, groans for the sons of God to be revealed. That's what it says in Romans 8, I believe. So uh, everything in the creation is centered around Christ. He works according to his will. And uh, yeah, so I don't, sorry, there's, there's nothing about free will in the Bible, and we shouldn't be making the gospel hinge on the belief in that, is what I wanted to say. Yeah, and I guess if I had any final thought to it is God didn't force Eve to sin. He created her to sin. And we know that's the case even from their free will choice perspective because he could have created any other person that in their scenario could have made the free will right choice, they say, which means they would have never sinned. So he could have created someone that never sinned. So now we know he created someone to sin. So they keep saying, he didn't author sin, he didn't create sin. I create light, I create darkness, I create well-being, I create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. He's created all things for his purposes. So you know, they say that he didn't create people to sin. Well, then why did he create Eve? If he could have created any other two free will agents not to sin, why didn't he create them? So Something they'll never be able to answer from any logical or biblical perspective. You know, without making stuff up and importing everything and just, you know, just, just telling people, look, you know, God gave man free will, even though the Bible doesn't say that. Does that concern anybody who comes is, is still stuck under the free will perspective? Just ask yourself that. Lean on the scripture, not the arm of flesh. You see, Greg and people like him, they lean on the arm of flesh. And I'm not trying to just be offensive and, and create, you know, uh, a drama and things like that. When someone comes out and says, you have to believe a certain type of theology about free will, believe in the God of the Bible, this guy's muddy in the gospel. As much as you love Greg and he's got the fan base and all that, and he, he preaches the gospel a lot, well, now in recent days, he's revealed that he really thinks that there's another set of knowledge, another set of facts that come with the gospel. Those on the fence about predestination and free will and determinism and free will and things like that. We want you to know that you, when you believe the gospel and he gives you that understanding, that's not going to be the first thing that you understand. You're going to understand that he was risen by the power of God and that he died for you. Amen.